Hello again. All right, this week, uh, this is Remembrance Day today, so we're going to have a few words to say about our veterans. In Canada, we have a long tradition of um, every Remembrance Day, we read a poem by John McRae, a Canadian poet who wrote uh, a poem from the First World War called In Flanders Fields. So I thought I'd just read, read that for the beginning of this video, and then we'll get on with our video. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high, if you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And then, for those of you who don't know, Flanders Fields is in France, and uh, it's just a huge field of white crosses, uh, miles and miles of them. And they're all over Europe, but uh, Flanders is one, uh, one of the large uh, Canadian graves there. So... And uh, taking up the fight and the torch for freedom is not always about fighting in wars. It's about standing up for what is right, standing up for truth. And it wasn't only in war that we lost a lot of heroes. The martyrs were heroes. The uh, settlers were heroes. Everyone who stood up for liberty for mankind. So that we are not just slaves to a small class of people. And we should always remember that. And never forget that uh, they work for us. We don't work for them. Okay, this week's video is about the woman at the well. The Samaritan woman whom Jesus met at Jacob's well. And first... Uh, we're going to learn a bit about the history of the Samaritans and who are they exactly because this really plays into the theme of what's happening and we're going to look at uh, what Jesus thought about this is very important and what does the Samaritans contribute to the story um, so we're going to learn all of these things and a much deeper understanding of the Samaritan woman at the well. Now don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And let's start off with some history about the Samaritans. So during the time of Christ, where Samaria was, was sort of this little piece here. Jerusalem is right in here. And this here is the Sea of Galilee. And this here is the Dead Sea. So between the Sea of Galilee and Jerusalem, this area up here, and along the left side of the Jordan River, the west side, this area, north of Jerusalem, south of Galilee, that was Samaria in the time of Christ. And the Jews uh, and the Samaritans didn't uh, mix culturally at all. They were... Uh, against each other and uh, so the Jews going from Jerusalem up into Galilee they would have to go take the road through Samaria which was very dangerous because they could be robbed or hup or mugged or they or they had to go all the way around they'd go down the hill into Jericho cross the Jordan River and take a trail up this way and then back into the Golan into the uh, Galilee area. 
So Jesus was cutting through Samaria when he met the woman at the well. So this was the kingdom of Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north in about 700 BC uh, when the king of Assyria from the Assyrian Empire up here all the way in through Iraq and, um, and Syria the Tiglath Pileser II came down and he took Samaria and all of the kingdom of Israel and took them all captive and carried them off as captives and he also went down the 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 eastern bank of the Jordan River all the way down into Moab and Edom he didn't take Edom captive but he took Moab captive and Ammon he took these two kingdoms and basically wiped them all out and he replaced them with other people that's a that's the thing that the Assyrians would love to do is they take a people out of their homeland and replace them with other people and he would switch their homelands so that this kept them weak and and and, and losing any connection to the land so Israel was taken away and and the people brought in to replace them they were the Samaritans and the Samaritans when they came so we'll read in the Bible about how that happened we'll find it in 2nd Kings chapter 17 I'll start in verse 22 for the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam which he did they departed not from them that's Jeroboam who set up the golden calves in the northern kingdom until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had said by all his servants the prophets so was Israel car carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day and this is the northern kingdom of Israel the lost ten tribes and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kata and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them wherefore they spoke to the king of Assyria saying the nations which thou has removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land therefore he has sent lions among them and behold they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the land then the king of Assyria commanded saying carry thither one of the priests who you brought from there and let them go and dwell there and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land and one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord how be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the house of the high places which the, which the Samaritans had made every nation in their cities where they dwelt so then uh, Jesus when he was walking on the earth during his ministry he didn't go to the Gentiles some Gentiles came to him but and he healed them out of compassion but his mission was to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel so uh, here's a story in Matthew chapter 15 say starting at verse 22 and behold a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying have mercy on me O Lord thou son of David my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil but he answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she cries after us but he answered and said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel then she came and worshipped him saying Lord help me but he answered and said it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs and she said truth Lord yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their masters table 
Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou will. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So you see, he, he wasn't open to um, healing or serving Gentiles because his mission on earth was focusing on Israel. The, uh, the gospel went to the Gentiles after the crucifixion. And I think it has to do with uh, property rights. Like who they serve. If they serve the God of Israel, then Jesus is, is their servant. But if they serve other gods, then Jesus is not their servant. And, and he's not going to... Uh, um, go to other people's servants. But when he was crucified, then he won the right to go to all of them, to go to all people. Now, there are still Samaritans living in Israel today, in some parts. And this is the type of, this is called Samaritan script. Now, the Samaritan Bible is only the Torah. It's the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So when they, when they uh, started to learn from the prophet that uh, the king of uh, Assyria sent to them, then they learned uh, this ancient type of Paleo-Hebrew, which is an ancient Hebrew script. And they, this is their Torah. Now, they've changed a few of the sentences in it to make it look like they were the original people in the land. And this is another contention with the Jews. But other than those few sentences, the Torah is very much like the Hebrew Bible. Uh, now, the Hebrews developed their language further while the Samaritans stayed with this ancient script. And this ancient script has become very helpful in, uh, in, for linguists to learn about the Hebrew and the other ancient scripts. So here's like the developments. This here is modern Hebrew. This, this, is, the, this is the Hebrew script that we find now. And so this would be the oldest uh, Sinai script. It was pre-Phoenician type of script. And, and through these progress of uh, Paleo-Hebrew, Paleo you'll find the Samaritan script is in one of these. It's, it's one of these types of scripts. So it's an older form of Hebrew, which is pretty cool. There's an ancient inscription in Samaritan Hebrew in Palestine. And uh, at one point, Hebrew was almost the same as this. It's just that it developed over the years, like any language does. So, uh, in studying the Torah, the, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch, which means, Pentateuch is the Greek word for Torah. It means five books. So the Torah is the Hebrew Pentateuch, and the Samaritan Torah is called the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, so when you're uh, studying the original languages and studying all the manuscripts like scholars do, then the, Pen the Samaritan Pentateuch becomes an important tool to compare with, with uh, the letters that you're reading in other manuscripts, to, and it kind of gives a, uh, a waypoint for scholars. See, when the Hebrews were carried off into Babylon, they ended up developing this more squared off type of letter, which led to uh, modern Greek and Latin and English. These are the uh, precursors of the Latin alphabet.
but the Samaritans is a more of a scraggly picture, pic, pictograph type of uh, letters. Okay, <clears throat> Samaritanism is centered on the Samaritan Pentateuch, which Samaritans believed to be the original and unaltered version of the Torah that was given to Moses and the Israelites on Mount Sinai. The Samaritan Pentateuch contains some differences from the Masoretic version of the Torah used in Judaism. According to Samaritan tradition, key parts of the Jewish texts were fabricated by Ezra. The Samaritan version of the book of Joshua also differ, differs from the Jewish version, which focuses on Shiloh. According to Samaritan tradition, Joshua built a temple on Mount Gerizim and placed a tabernacle there in the second year of the Israelites' entry into the land of Canaan. And see this here, Mount Shiloh, that is in the book of Joshua, that has been found and identified. See, there it is there. there you can go visit Shiloh now. It's, the the uh, descriptions of it and everything match up with the book. That, and, and they found evidence that the tabernacle was actually there, like the Bible says. Now, the Samaritans... This is the ruins of the Samaritan Temple in 1880. I'm not sure how it got ruined. Probably in the Jewish-Samaritan Wars, maybe. And uh, so there's the ruins of their temple. And they celebrate the same festivals, almost, as the Jews. The Passover and uh, Unleavened Bread and the Fall Festivals and all that. Um... But they all focus everything around Mount Gerizim, which is in the West Bank. And that is where Jacob's well is. When, when Jacob came out of the land of Syria with his wives and his children to come back and face Izu, he settled there in Mount Gerizim. And then they had the, uh, the problem with Dinah being uh, raped by the prince who loved her and uh, they circumcised all the people in the town and then killed them and then they had to flee or, and, or uh, Jacob got very worried and God told him to go to Bethel where he was supposed to go in the first place but that's probably the temple right there on top of the mountain at Shechem, Shechem, in the, in the Jewish Bible it's called right there, Shechem, which means shoulder, and it looks like a big shoulder. And somewhere around here would be Jacob's well. There. <clears throat> so here's Jacob's well in 1839, uh, a painting of it. I guess that's the well back in here. It's right there in the West Bank, right about in the middle of the West Bank. And there's Jacob's well in 2013. It's got a whole chapel built around it now. And that was dug by Jacob when he came back into Israel. Okay, here's the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. You'll find it in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself does not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. So he's cutting through Samaria to get to Galilee from Judea, which is Jerusalem, probably. And he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of crown that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. 
there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So here, uh, now this is a different thing is that from the Gentiles, because Jesus came to her and asked her for a drink. Um, and and as a in contrast to Rachel, uh, it kind of hit me that this is a bit of a contrast with Rachel. Rachel, who said, "I will not only give you a drink, but I will water your camels also." She was very willing to give a drink to a stranger, but the Samaritan woman saw that he was a Jew and started to question him and, and was suspicious of him. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From where then have you that living water? Because you'd need a rope and a bucket, I guess, to, to, dwell, to draw from the well. Are you greater than our father Jacob? So now she's claiming heritage from Jacob, you see, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. So she's claiming direct lineage from Jacob. And Jesus answered and said to her, See, you notice Jesus didn't get into any debate with her about Jacob and about her being a child of Jacob. He said, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So he's contrasting the, the, the water that he has to give with the water from Jacob's well and, and, and the heritage that he has to give in contrast with the heritage of being from Jacob. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. Now that was a common thing in the day that um, um, a man didn't normally talk too long with a woman, especially a married woman, uh, without her husband being present. So he said, Go get your husband. And the woman, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he who you now has is not your husband. In that said you truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So now she's still pushing this Jew-Samaritan uh, narrative, saying this is why Samaritans never get along with Jews and Jews with Samaritans. Right? And uh, you, you're, you say you ought to go to Jerusalem, so why are you talking about this living water and our fathers worshipped in this mountain? at Jacob's well. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship... you. So the hour is coming when there will be neither in Jerusalem or this mountain. 
You worship what you know not. We know what we worship. So now he's associating himself with the Jews, and he's giving her the truth. The Samaritans don't know what they're talking about, and the Jews know what they worship because salvation is of the Jews. Because Jesus is from the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, it's happening right now, he's saying, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not about what race you are. It's about your spirit and your truth. <clears throat> For the Father seeks such to worship Him. That's what the Father is looking for. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's, uh, the gospel doesn't go out to the entire earth until after his crucifixion, but he's gearing it up. And he's offering it to her already, and she's not a Jew. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I that speak unto you am he. I'm the Messiah, and I'm telling you all things. And upon this came the disciples. They came back from the town. They went to get food. And they marveled that he talked with the woman. It's like, you're talking with a woman? And no one said, what do you want? And why do you talk with her? They were like, what's he doing? Trying to pick her up or what's going on? You know, they were all kind of wondering. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Isn't this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat, like you haven't eaten. <laughs> and he said to them, I have meat to eat that you do not know of. Because he said in another place that, um, my food is to do the will of my Father. Therefore, the, the disciples said to one another, Has any man brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, Oh, it's right here. Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Do ye not say there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal, that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice. So some, some people sow and sow and sow, and other people reap. Uh, it's, it's about making people uh, turn to God. And herein is the saying true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap where you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you entered into their labors. And that's the prophet who taught the Samaritans, right? And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they besought him that he would tarry there with them, and he stayed there two days. Usually the Jews would get mugged around there. And many more believed because of his, of his own word. And they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you say, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ the Savior of the world. And after two days he departed and went into Galilee. 
So Jesus, this is the interesting thing, is that because the Samaritans, they when they came into the land, they said, who is the God of this land? And um, the king of Assyria sent a prophet to teach them. And even though they didn't get it all right, because Jesus testified that salvation is of the Jews and the Samaritans don't know what they're talking about. But even though they got a, a part of it wrong, like building the temple in the wrong place and thinking that Joshua built the temple, when none of that's true, their heart was for God. So Jesus didn't treat the Samaritans any different than he did the Jews. And he said, I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I think he, he was treating the Samaritans as a part of the house of Israel. And offering them salvation before the crucifixion. And he went and visited this town. And, and he also used them in, in his parables as an example of loving your brother. So he's saying that, that uh, it's very interesting anyway how, how the Samaritans fit into all this. And now their, their, uh, their text, their ancient text, is actually a, a very good tool for scholarship in studying the Hebrew Bible. And then aside from all that, the main point of this is that Jesus said what Jesus was actually teaching. The saying that God is a spirit and they that worship him was worship, worship him in spirit and in truth. And what I have is a living water that you will never thirst again. Because once you find the Spirit of God within you, you don't really thirst again as you did before that. And, uh, and he right here, people say that Jesus never said that he was the Christ. There he is right here. He said to her, I that speak to you am he. Who? The Christ. <laughs> so he never actually said, I am the Christ. But he answered that question positively in several places. And this is like, how can you get more obvious than this? And it's interesting how he kind of resolved this Samaritan issue here. By saying, yeah, you can be saved too, even though you're wrong. <laughs> All right, so that wraps up the video for today. Have a good week, and I'll see you next week. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. Thank you.